Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Adam Greco and I'm with Search Discovery and I manage the SDEC. Uh, for those of you who are new to the SDEC, we are a free educational community um, that provides uh, webinars on a weekly basis related to things like digital marketing and digital analytics. Today's session is going to be in our testing area. And uh, during the session, if you have questions for our presenter, please use the Zoom Q&A and we will get to all of those questions after um, Ellie is done with her content. If you have any technical problems or questions about the SDEC, you can ping me in the chat and I'll be more than happy to help you. And if you aren't already a member of the SDEC, I'm gonna be posting in a second in the chat some information about how you can join for free. And some of the advantages of joining officially as a member is that you'll be notified ahead of time of sessions like this, via calendar invites, and you have access to over 50 past recordings. So uh, with that, I'm excited to welcome Ellie. Ellie, thank you so much for taking the time to join us at the SDEC. And I will hand it off to you and uh, touch back at the end uh, when we have questions. So thanks so much. Super excited to be here, Adam. And uh, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I'm really excited to talk about what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I am a professor at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Um, for those of you who don't know, Drexel has been doing co-op education for 100 years now. We celebrated the anniversary last year. And so our students um, work in full-time positions at ad agencies here in Philadelphia and across the country at uh, major advertisers like Johnson & Johnson, Comcast, um, and so uh, we really have kind of a, a hands-on take on, um, on education. And so it's exciting to be for me to talk to a group like this, because I see you as kind of the future version of what my students are like. Um, so let's just jump right in. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, becoming a data maker. And I, I have an analogy that I want to start you guys off with. Um, whoops, hang on. I'm having trouble advancing my slides. Um, a lot of the work we do as data analysts or when I am uh, teaching students for the first time how to go into Google Analytics and, and dig for insights. Have you ever given someone that advice before? Let's just go in and dig for insights. Um, it reminds me of, of mining. So this is a dime, picture of a diamond mine in Botswana, Africa. And you can see it's just a massive, massive operation. We have this gigantic hole in the ground. Um, this truck is like 10 times the size of any other truck. And we're just sifting through these massive uh, piles of information to try to find those insights. Um, and it takes a huge amount of data engineering. You know, you can think of all the the trucks down here digging the hole, they're the data engineers. And way up here, this is actually the breaker where they take the ore apart and try to find the diamonds. That's us, the analysts. We're trying to sift through all this massive amount of data and find the insights um, that are going to help decision makers make decisions ultimately. And uh, the reason I bring up this analogy is that I don't know uh, how many of you know this, but um, these days we can make diamonds. Uh, literally, we can make diamonds. This is what a lab-grown diamond lab looks like. So these are giant, um, you know, uh, com they compress the carbon and turn it into a diamond in those big black spheres. And experiments, I like to think of experiments as um, basically a tool that lets us get rid of all the ore, stop saving every interaction we've ever had with a customer, and just collect data on the things we need to make a decision. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you don't, if the rest of the talk starts to get super technical, just remember that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to think about how do we create diamonds of insight for our clients, for the businesses that we support. So I want to um, talk, let's talk about, you know, the nitty gritty of an A-B test. So this is a typical email A-B test setup. So here we're trying to say, find out what is the best subject line for this email. So already we're focused. We are thinking about a specific business problem that we're trying to solve. It's kind of a trivial one. What should the subject line of this email say? Um, but it, 
it does focus us. That's what we're doing. We are not digging through ore. And, you know, if we find an emerald instead of a diamond, we're not going to go after it. We're trying to make a diamond of insight, which is what should the subject line of this email be? Um, and many of you have been faced with a screen like this. This is a screenshot from a typical email product uh, where you have to set that slider. So you have to decide uh, we're going to send the email in this case out to 8,910 people, version A, the same number, version B. And then once we get the data back, we're going to use that insight to drive a specific decision, um, which is which version to deploy to the remaining 41,584 email addresses that we have. Um, so if we're going to focus on that, um, the reason I, I bring up that example is it allows us to think about a very specific goal and be actually kind of quantitative about that goal and exactly how much data do we need to collect in the test in order to make a profit maximizing decision when we go ahead and deploy. So let's write down, um, you know, using a little bit of mathematical notation, what is our goal? Our goal is to in the test phase, we're going to have N1 and N2 customers that we uh, send the treatments. Now I'm starting to use the language of statistics. We call the subject lines treatments. I'm gonna collect data on their response. And then in the roll phase, uh, the deploy phase, we're gonna choose a treatment and we're gonna get to deploy it to capital N minus N1 minus N2. And this just reflects the reality of the business problem that we face. Once we've sent the email to the N1 plus N2 customers, we can't send it to them again, we're gonna send it to whatever is left over. And so this defines what we call a Bayesian decision problem. So what I'm gonna walk you through in the next 22 minutes is how to solve this Bayesian decision problem. Of course, I spent two years thinking about this problem, so hopefully I make it look easy um, or make it easy for you guys. So how do we solve this problem? So we're trying to decide what N1 and N2 should be. What should the sample size be in our test? Um, and so in order to solve this problem, um, I'm a Bayesian, so I think about my priors, which actually are a real thing and not some made up thing from the tech scene over on the West Coast. Um, but really, what do I think the range of lifts that I might see between version A and version B of the email? And so if you're the kind of person like me who squirrels away old test results, you could actually go and find every A-B test you've run before. Um, and what I have plotted here is actually um, a little cache of A-B tests that I got from a major website testing platform. Uh, it's one you probably know the name of. And this is the observed lifts for 2100 website A-B tests that were conducted um, by various customers of this A-B testing platform. So these are all different kinds of um, marketers, but you could actually use your own data here and make this plot. And we can see most of the time what happens in an A-B test, mwah, mwah, we get no lift. It doesn't matter which one we pick, they both perform equally well. That's these all these big bars kind of near zero. Basically A and B are you know close enough and we could pick either one, but occasionally A is a lot better and occasionally B is a lot better. And our goal for the business is to help them find those, those cases where um, it really makes a big difference and they really should go with one subject line versus the other. And I can actually take a, a histogram like this and quantify it. So in these tests, um, the conversion was defined as clicking to the next page in the website. Uh, and so the average conversion rate for these websites was where these tests were conducted was about 0.68. Uh, with a standard deviation of 0.03. And if you forgot about standard deviation, it's just a measure of how what, what's the spreadiness of that histogram. It's just a way of quantifying that. So now I have, um, I have some priors. I have some beliefs about what might happen in my test based on what happened in these previous tests. Now you could do this yourself. In fact, um, I would recommend that you do it with your own data because your own data will reflect the kind of lifts that you see in the kind of tests that you run and the kind of conversion rates you get on your site. All right, so once I have these numbers, this is the really cool part. Um, I and I have to give a little bit of credit to uh, my co-author, Ron Berman at Wharton. Um, he did a bunch of algebra and calculus and uh, was able, we can actually 
write down a formula for the profit that you earn in this test and roll, which is a sum of the conversions that you get in the test phase. Because remember, in the test phase, we're still running a business, we're still making money, and the conversions that you get in the roll stage. So in the test stage, you're sending the wrong thing to half the people. So it, that's not great. We'd like to keep the test kind of small, but we want to mitigate the risk that we deploy the wrong one and really lose out on a winning opportunity there. And we, so we can quantify all that, write down the equations. I won't show you the ugly equation, but of course, you, I'll, I'll show you where you could find it if you were interested in it later. Um, but for right now, let's look at a picture of that. So this is the profit that we get from a test and roll as a function of the test size. So, and it says N1 equals N2. So here I'm saying like at 10,000, I'm saying 10,000 in A, 10,000 in B, and the total population here was 100,000. That's what I had available for the test. Um, so I can uh, plot that. We can see that here at 2,284 uh, people in each condition in the test, I get my maximum profit. I get the most boobs. But there's a couple other cool things on this plot. In fact, when we first, um, created this plot and Ron and I were on a call to talk about what it meant. The really important part to me here is that even little tiny tests boost the profit. See how this line goes up, 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 up through the stratosphere. So even if you're a small marketer, you can run small tests and you will still be getting a huge amount of the benefit. Um, on the flip side, if you run a test that's a little too big, you don't lose too much. The slope is not as steep on this side. You kind of have a cliff if we um, make the test too small, but if we make the test too big, it's kind of a gentle slope. So if you make it a little bit too big, um, you're not gonna kill yourself uh, you, or kill, kill yourself. I mean, kill your profits. So um, that's the expected profit in a test and roll. Um, once you have this expected profit formula, remember from calculus, you can take the derivative and set that equal to zero and find out the optimal profit in a function, in a formula. I did that. And there it is. So there's the formula for the profit maximizing sample size for an A-B test. Um, when we started this project, uh, I had this idea that it would be good to relook at A-B tests from the perspective of profit and our goal for the A-B test. Um, boy, I did not imagine that I would invent a new sample size formula, but in fact, that's what we did. Um, I won't get into all, what all the letters mean here, um, but let me tell you some kind of cool facts about this formula. If you have noisier data, that's governed by this S parameter. Um, that means you should have a larger test. So if you have noisier data, you should have a larger test. Uh, if you have a larger population, you should run a test, larger test. So big advertisers with big ends where they could, um, you know, make a little bit, you know, run a little bit bigger test, but then they win it back on this giant customer base that they have in the deploy stage, they should run bigger tests. Um, and then the last one was kind of a puzzle. So this sigma here, this is the measure of the spreadiness of the lifts we've seen in previous tests. So let me just pop back here. It's how wide is this histogram? Like how often do we see like really massive winners, you know, golden ticket lifts in an A-B test? Um, so that's what that sigma is telling you. And it's saying, if sigma is bigger, that means there's more golden tickets out there and you should run a bigger test to try to find them. If everything's bunched up around zero in your lifts, um, then actually, uh, you know, there's not actually that much to win or lose and you should probably get away with running smaller tests. Um, so that's that formula now. This is the point where I expect you to be like leaping out of your seats through the Q&A and going, Ellie, Ellie, there is already a sample size formula. I have a calculator. People have taught me how to do this before and it's not that formula. And you are absolutely right. It isn't that formula. Yes, you learned a sample size formula either in your stats class or maybe you learned it on the job. Um, there is a sample size formula that has existed for as long as I've been alive. Um, and that formula looks like this. So I'm calling it NHT to stand for hypothesis test because this is the sample size formula for a hypothesis test, um, which is this whole thing with the type one and the type two errors. You guys remember the Z-scores? Those of us who are old enough remember looking up the Z-scores in the back of the book. Um, and it's got the same S, the noisiness of the data. Uh, and then it has this D, which is the difference to detect. 
hopefully some of this is familiar to some of you. Um, and it has different implications than the formula I just showed you. The most important one is that big N does not appear in this formula. This sample size that you guys have been using, it doesn't vary based on the number of people in, that you have in your total population. In fact, the reason I kind of got interested in this project was I was coaching students through running A-B tests and they were often working with startups that had very small um, you know, total populations that they could get either through their email list or their website, or um, even if they were buying media, they couldn't afford uh, very many advertisements. So their capital N is kind of small. They would run the sample size formula and they go, hey, professor, it says more people than I can possibly get, like 10 times more people than I possibly get. Um, so, so hopefully some of you have kind of run into that situation as well. Um, it's really frustrating. The, no, the hypothesis test sample size formula just ignores how much you could feasibly get because it's not thinking about profit. It's thinking about what would be a good sample size to make sure that I have a very low rate of mistakes. And the standard rate of mistakes is 5% type one mistakes, which means I declare that A and B are um, different when they're truly actually the same and 20% um, type two mistakes, which means I declare a winner when there really isn't a winner. Uh, why 5% and 20%? I don't know. It's totally arbitrary, um, but this is the standards that we have established for science. Um, and so, um, yeah, sorry, I, I skipped a slide there. Um, these, are the, these are sort of the formula we've established and the standards we've established for the mistakes that we're willing to tolerate in science. Now, I don't know about you. When people are testing my vaccine, I kind of like these standards. I want big sample sizes. I want to make sure we're not making a mistake there. Um, but in business, when we're talking about a subject line, a subject line. Now, come on now. If we send the wrong subject line, nobody's dying. Um, we might make a little bit less money. And so we should actually look at that sort of problem from the perspective of profit and not from the perspective of sort of science. Um, there's another interesting thing about this formula. The noisier the data gets, you need a much, 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 much larger sample size. In particular, you'll, you probably noticed if your output of your experiment, your measure is a binary thing like conversions, you'll often get sample sizes like 10,000, 15,000 in order to um, you know, detect a reasonable lift in that. Um, and I can actually show you that in a picture. So this black line here is the recommended sample size for a test and roll. And this red line, it's kind of dotted. I don't know if you can see it, but it kind of swings up. Um, that is the required sample size for a hypothesis test. And this on the x-axis here, what I have is how noisy is the data is. So as the, as the data gets noisier, um, the profit maximizing sample size grows as a line, but the hypothesis testing sample size grows as a square, which means to get that kind of high level of certainty when the data is noisy, you're going to have to really ramp up the sample sizes. So if you've been fighting sample size wars uh, within your organization, it's because you're fighting this, this curve that's happening right here. So just to summarize, We've got two sample size formulas. When should you use one? Well, you should use the hypothesis test one when you're doing science and you want to know which treatment is better for all time. Uh, and you don't explicitly consider the cost of the test itself. They don't, they don't account for that. That's not like part of the decision making. But in marketing, when we're doing these kinds of tests and roles where we're testing something that is very tactical, that information is basically only going to be used for a finite amount of time. And then we're going to move on to whatever the next thing we're doing is. That's when you should think about using this test and roll formula. Um, and it considers the cost of the test relative to the error rate. That's kind of the real thing. We're actually making a trade-off between how big the test is versus how sure we are that we're going to pick the right treatment. Um, in fact, you can get that in a formula too. So um, we did all that math. I, you can look at it. It's in the, the appendix of the paper or something. But here's a plot of it. For this particular example, I can show you that as the test gets bigger, my error rate, so the chance that I pick the wrong one 
because it kind of comes up the winner in the test. Even it just got lucky because it was a small sample size. Um, that error rate goes down, 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 down. As we get a bigger sample size, we get this um, in the knee and the curve here is where that optimal sample size is. And this is literally a calculated risk. In this case, I'm telling you, um, in this particular case, given the lifts that we've seen in prior tests and the amount of money that's on the table for you, um, the calculated risk is 10%. You should be willing to accept the fact that uh, you're going to roll the wrong treatment 10% of the time. Uh, and you should tolerate that because the winnings that you can get on the other side to make it back from a bigger test just aren't there. Uh, and so, because you're eating up your total population um, that you can reach by, with the test. Um, so you wanna, you wanna, you know, you could, you could noodle around with the type one and type two error rates if you wanted to, and you'd actually kind of get to the same result as this, but we're just saying, sit down, write down your goal. What is the insight you need to make that goal? And let's collect exactly as much data as we need to make that, um, that decision as optimally as we can. Um, I'm not, uh, yeah, just looking at the, just managing time here. Okay, this is the last sort of meaty data slide. So I, I took this particular case with the website lists from the big website testing platform. Um, and I was designing this hypothetical test that we're running uh, with a hundred population of a hundred thousand people. Um, so we're gonna test on a subset of that population and then deploy to that population. And in the paper, I have this table where I compare that. So that's test and roll on the middle line here. We're going to send it to 2,200. Um, we expect to get 3,106 conversions in the test phase, another 66,000 in the roll phase. That gives us an overall of 69,536. So I compared that to some other things. One is I could do no test. I could just randomly choose between A and B or let the hippo make the decision. That's going to get us 68,000. Not, you know, these are all good you know, marketers. We have good ideas. They're all pretty good. We're doing the test to find really the best thing, the best thing among things that are pretty good. Um, this one at the bottom, perfect information is if, 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 uh, you know, the all knowing deity came from the sky and told us which one to use. Um, and that gets us up to 69, 6. 39. So it's actually a very small gap. This test and roll gets you almost all the way to perfect. Of course, we can't be perfect because nobody's perfect. Um, this is the, the line here with hypothesis test is telling you 69,060 conversions if you made that bigger sample size. So if you're using the wrong sample size formula, in this case, you're losing about 530 conversions, 500 and uh, sorry, less than that, um, 470 conversions roughly. And then this uh, fourth line here, that's Thompson sampling. So Thompson sampling is kind of a fancy uh, machine learning, adaptive learning experimentation uh, strategy, which some of you might have seen before. Sometimes it's called multi-arm bandit. Uh, so multi-arm bandit is actually the name of the problem. And Thompson sampling is uh, one solution to that problem. And if I put those together, um, I do do a little bit better, but Thompson sampling, so it says it's like a test and roll, but after each data point you collect, you can kind of continuously decide um, to roll an unfair coin to decide which treatment you're gonna use next. Um, so it's kind of cool for website testing because what'll happen is you won't have a moment where you make a deploy decision, but you'll kind of like continuously shift over to the the treatment that's performing better. So that's kind of cool. Um, it's a real pain in the ass to deploy because you've got this like analysis thing that's interacting with the site in real time. Whereas with um, a test and roll, you've got a randomized experiment that's running and then you run that for a short amount of time, you turn that off, you flip the switch to, to, do, to deploy the one that works better um, permanently. So we were kind of excited about this because um, basically I was in like a, a academic smackdown where someone was like, oh, wouldn't a multi-arm bandit test Thompson sampling be better? And of, you know, my answer was of course. And then I actually ran it and I'm like, well, it's better, but you know, it's still pretty darn close. You know, that only gets you a hundred more. Um, and so it's up to you to decide. Like, I wouldn't say don't deploy a Thompson sampling routine on your website, but maybe you do want to, um, 
you know, consider what the costs are. The real problem that I see with those in practice is that um, they they stop working correctly. Like it just like in theory and on paper, it works great. But when we actually put it into a production website environment, um, the, the allocations that Thompson sampling says to do somehow don't translate into what's actually happening on the website. Uh, and so that can be very frustrating. Whereas with the test and roll, um, you also have the satisfaction of a decision maker gets to come in, declare a winner and okay, now we know what we're doing. Um, so, you know, those are the, the pros and cons between those, but we were really excited about the fact where, um, that they were pretty close. The one case where Thompson sampling starts to do a lot better is if you have like 10 treatments or, you know, 10 different subject lines you want to figure out or 15 or 20 as the numbers start to get larger, um, then you would, uh, the Thompson sampling is somewhat favored. All right. I'm going to skip that for now. Um, I was asked to wrap it up. Uh, by the, the top of the hour, and I think I can do that. So I'm just going to point you to some resources that you might want to take a look at if this intrigued you. Um, so the first place to go is to my Twitter, which is at Ellie Fight. Um, and the pinned tweet at the top of my Twitter is a 17-tweet uh, thread about this paper and um, you know why I think this is important. And it goes into a little more technical detail. It's kind of written for uh, the nerds in the room. So that might be a place that you go. Feel free to ask questions or retweet you know, tweets from that. And I, I will definitely keep an eye on that. And I, I like to respond there. Um, so you can take a look at that. Um, you might also be interested in some of my other research on marketing experiments. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a project uh, where we built a big hierarchical base model to understand um, basically how sensitive are customers to catalogs that they were receiving. So we had customers who were in and out of catalog holdout tests. Sometimes they were getting the catalog, sometimes they weren't. Uh, so we would um, we stacked all that data together and were able to estimate the catalog sensitivity and the email sensitivity for every customer. <laughs> you know what's really cool? Some customers are uh, sensitive to catalogs, some sensitive to emails, and there's no correlation there. Um, so you really do want to hit the people who like email better or respond better to email with emails and the people who respond better to catalogs with catalogs. Um, more recently, I'm working on a second paper with Ron that is about increasing the power of experiments where the response is positive with many zeros. So this is really a practical problem because uh, a lot of people are running a test like um, you know, where the outcome that they're trying to measure is sales for each customer. So if you've ever looked at data like that, it's going to be a ton of zeros and then some positive numbers uh, thrown in. And we have a way of um, analyzing those that gives you a little bit more certainty about uh, what the lifts are that you're getting in that kind of a test. Um, the other thing you might want to take a look at is on my website, which is lafight.com. I have a whole page of tutorials, which are like my tutorials tend to be very coding intensive. So if you know how to do something and you want to learn how to do it in R, you could read it and kind of see how I did it in R. Or if um, you want to learn, you know R and you want to learn how to do something, you can kind of go the other way and um, read the R code to learn how to, how to do things. So you can take a look at those. Um, and last but not least, I have two books. Um, they're both designed to teach you how to do programming for people who maybe you know, did a marketing degree and never thought about being a programmer, but are realizing kind of after the fact that it's a good idea to build up some programming skills. So the first book is R for Marketing, and then which I wrote with Chris Chapman, who's a UX researcher at Google. And then Jason Schwartz came in and took our R code and translated it to Python, which I think is the coolest thing ever. I'm the author of a Python book, but I can't write Python myself. I can read it, but I can't write it. Um, so I proofread the whole book as the, the novice reader. Um, so both of those are designed to teach you coding and then take you into sort of fancy analysis that you might want to do, like cluster analysis, conjoint analysis, um, clusters for segmentation conjoint analysis for new product design and a bunch of other kind of cool stuff that you can do in R and Python. Um, so that's it for me. I'm really looking forward to your questions. Okay, Ellie, thank you so much. I, I have to admit that um, you scared me a little bit. I had like flashbacks of being in stats in college and shaking in a corner because I was terrible at all that stuff. But 
awesome. This is, I, this is really I am amazing. an expert <laughs> at teaching uh, marketing electives to people exactly like that. That's my favorite thing to do is to take someone who is terrified by their spats teacher and kind of the first thing is take a big deep breath, Adam, and say, it's all about figuring out, do we have enough data to come to a conclusion? Do we yeah. have enough data to come to a conclusion? Just keep that in mind and that'll take you 80% of the way. Well, my son is going to be a freshman uh, starting in stats and economics this fall. So oh, congratulations. I, might, I, might, I might point him your way. He's, he's, he's into all this stuff. Uh, everyone on the call, um, if you have questions for Ellie, we have a couple out there now. Uh, please post questions now. Um, I'm going to go through the ones we have. And then I know Tim Wilson, uh, he's already slacking me. He's got a couple questions he wants to ask you as well. So uh, let's dive in. Um, in the beginning, you talked about a mining analogy, and Paul asks, do you suggest methods for this type of mining or uh, EDA, ex exploratory data analysis, for your students? I do. Plotting. Just plot the data. There's nothing like a picture. Because most of the fancier statistical methods impose very tight assumptions on the data, and sometimes it's like buried, like, you know, you pull out your TensorFlow in Python and want to do some blah, blah, blah machine learning model, and you don't actually know what assumptions are baked into that analysis. Um, and so the best thing is just like a good picture. Like I often sit and literally sketch with a pencil uh, what I would like to see. So not tool-based uh, driving a visualization, but first I draw a picture this is what I would like to see. And then I start thinking, you know, what are the tools to actually generate that picture from a large data set? So that would be my, my biggest thing for that kind of exploratory data analysis. And I can't tell you how many times I myself have, you know, estimated a big fancy model. The, the results aren't coming out the way I expect. And I'm scratching my head and I plot the data and I'm like, oh, damn, that was not what I imagined was in this data. And the, you know, the picture is worth a thousand words in that case. So that's my answer okay. to that. Okay. Uh, next one. Would the profit maximizing formula work with more than two variants? Does N stay the same if we want N3, N4, et cetera? So it would get bigger as you had more. Uh, first of all, the answer is yes you can compute the profit maximizing sample size for bigger tests. It, we can't get the formula in closed form. So um, you actually have to do a little bit of optimization in order to solve that problem. So we can't close the integrals. Um, if, if you, I don't know if that even makes sense, close the integrals, but anyway, I can't, it can't write it down as a formula, but I can give you a piece of computer code that computes it. Um, and that computer code is actually on my GitHub. So there's, if you go to Ellie Fight on GitHub, the account is called Ellie Fight. I'm really good at the branding here. E-L-E-A-F-E-I-T, Twitter, my website uh, on GitHub. And then in there, there is a function that computes the optimal sample size that would allow you to do it. And the answer is you do need a bigger test. If you've got more things you're trying to sort out, you need a bigger test, but not as big as you think. Because if you take 10 things, there's probably two good things in that batch. Maybe one is a little better than the other, but even if you run kind of a smaller size test and you pick the wrong of those two, you're still way ahead of the game. And so you don't need as much sample size as you think to sort out those large numbers if you're willing to live with the risk that like, you know, picking the one that gives me a dollar versus the one that gives me 99 cents is like close enough. Um, yeah. What's next? Okay. Um, we actually had one question come in um, unrelated to the Q&A, but uh, someone had asked, which book of yours do you recommend to read first um, out of all your books? That I am making a funny face because that's a tough one for me. Actually, I should stop sharing, right? So no, that's okay. See. You can, that's fine, whichever. Is that? Yeah, that's fine. Um, anyway, so the that's a tough one for me because I think Python is exploding in its use, mostly because it's the intro programming language for people who get a CS degree. So it's kind of a good thing to know because it means when you interface with other 
you know, hardcore software developers, you'll be kind of speaking their language, so to speak, whereas R was really built for statisticians and has much more of a statistical flavor to it. So I think Python is probably more valuable out in the world, but you can still do more things in R and the R book is a little bit longer. Um, so I guess my take would be if, if you're a very beginner programmer and a little bit afraid, of programming, then you should start with the R book. If you, you know, want to go play with the cool kids, the software developers, then I would start with the Python book. But literally, the text around the code is exactly the same words. Like they, he, he literally took a copy of the files for the R book and only rewrote the sentences that needed to be rewritten. So, either awesome. one is probably good. Yeah, I know my son, my other son is learning CS, and of course, he's learning Python and has never heard of R. Um, then while, uh, before, one little aside, um, Ellie is going to actually be on uh, Tim Wilson's podcast soon. So Tim just put a link to that um, in there. Um, or actually, wait, is this a rebroadcast episode? Uh, so this is a rebroadcast re of a past episode that Tim just put in the chat. So if any of you want to go deeper into this topic, uh, go check out that rebroadcast. Okay, back to questions. Uh, could you please give pros and cons of using target sample size over random sample size when, um, I guess where and when is what I think they might be asking. Oh, I'm not sure what a random sample size is. Maybe the person who asked the question can clarify that. I don't, I'm just not familiar with that term. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll come back to that one, see if they can put a little uh, comment underneath that question. By um, the way, if you listen to that rebroadcast podcast, this whole thing was a twinkle in my eye at that time when we recorded it. So I mention it. I mention in the broadcast that I'm like thinking about something along these lines. So you can actually go back and kind of see where my head was when we started. Okay. Uh, next one. How do you define noise as it applies to the concept of needing a larger sample size? Do you often see evidence that different audience segments are a big factor in noise? Ah, really good question from Chris. So um, there's two kinds of noise that you have to think about. And in our formulas, that's the sigma and the S. Let's talk about the S first. The S is how much variation do you see from one person to another in the response? So if the response is sales, um, is there like a range of sales from $50 to $5,000? Or is this a dollar store and the range of sales we see is more like a dollar to $100? That would be a much, much lower level of noise. And so um, your getting back to your question, does segments play a role? Absolutely. So what happens is when, um, say you have a group of customers who typically spends around 50 bucks and another group of customers who typically spends around a thousand bucks, say you're Home Depot and you've got like contractor guys and people who are there just to like get something to clean their basement with. So, um, you know, the home improvement types that are buying smaller tickets. So when you have that mixture of tickets, that adds to the noise. And so if you're going to put all those people together in the same test and analyze it in a lump, uh, then you're going to have a problem um, with noise. You're going to have more noise because you're kind of mixing together these high numbers and these lower numbers. One thing you can do, uh, which is called stratification, if you can separate out those groups based on stuff you know about them, like they signed up for the contractor loyalty program and just put them in their own test, it can even be kind of run as the same test, but once you analyze it, you take them out and they're their own separate A-B test. That's called stratification and it, it radically increases your confidence about what's going on. Not only do you learn you know, which groups are getting the lift from this. And you can, um, you can solve Simpson's paradox, which is sometimes like when you aggregate the data altogether, it looks like things are going one way, but when you go down to the, the lower level, you can see that they're going the other way by segmenting. Uh, if you have a smart way to segment, you can, you can divide up those groups and see what's going on. And also you get more certainty and confidence from the same amount of data. Um, so excellent question. And I think we had a follow-up, but again, I'm a little bit over my head here. Uh, Greg says, bouncing on that, how do you think of standard deviation for binary results, sign up or not? Oh yeah, that's that. I meant to, thank you, Greg, Gregory. Um, I was meaning to bring that up. So uh, when you have a binary result, uh, there's this like kind of cool mathematical result that the standard deviation 
of a binary outcome. So you have a proportion that are going to be success. So if that success rate is like 10%, then the standard deviation of that is the square root of 10% times 90%. So P times one minus P. And that's a property of the binomial distribution. It's the same thing that allows us to make those Galton boards. You know how if you play um, Plinko, it, you end up with a normal distribution. I don't know if you've seen that. Look, Google search that. Plinko, Galton board, normal distribution, binomial properties. Um, all of that gives us this like nice result that for, um, for conversion rates, it's always square root of P times one minus P. Um, and if, if you're uncomfortable with like the radical sign, you know, in Excel, it's equals SQRT, open parentheses, blah, P times one minus P, close parentheses. So uh, really good question. That also reminds me, I meant to loop back to the sigma, the other kind of noise. So the sigma is how much variation do I get in the true lifts? I don't know the true lifts, but like how much variation is there in the true difference between A and B from one test to another? So that's the other sort of noise. And that one actually works the other way. We want that to be, if that's very noisy, then we can get away with a smaller test because it means that A and B are likely to be very different from one, one another. And I'll be able to see it with a, a smaller test, which is kind of, that was one of the results that totally surprised me. In fact, when I first wrote it up in English, Ron said, that's not right. And I said, no, it is right. Think about it. And then finally he, he agreed with me. Okay. Well, one last question here. Um, it's a little bit of a long one, so you'll have to help me figure out where the question is in here. It says, which conversion should I choose for this experiment. Um, you talked about profit and that would be like a transaction, but I have click to open, first click engagement on the website, possibly other click conversion along the funnel. Yeah, that's a really good question. So when we do an experiment, me as a statistician, I always say the outcome, whatever the outcome is that you're interested in. So in one of my examples, I was actually using conversions and I was I call it profit maximizing, but what I was doing was conversion maximizing, where conversion is click to the next page in that particular example. But it can be whatever the business's values. And so when I teach experiments to undergrads and master's students, you know, I say, you really do want to align that outcome with what the business is interested in, especially if you're going to optimize it like I'm doing. You want to optimize the right thing. Now, how do you pick the right thing? That That's a business strategy question. Um, I'm probably not particularly qualified to answer it, um, but one that I think the organization should try to grapple with and, and it shouldn't be considered, that shouldn't be a technical decision. That's one that needs to be, you know, elevated to the level of the, the CMO kind of level. Like, what is it we're trying to, to get after here. And at some companies that have really mature testing organizations, like say at a Facebook, they have a small set and the, and default ones. Like in general, um, I think one of the big ones for them is uh, the amount of time the user spends on the site over the next, some period, like the next week. And that's a like well-accepted test outcome for them. But you need to think about like, what is it you want your users to do? If I'm a Google, I might actually want to keep the time on site down because that would signal that I'm getting people off to where they want to be when they, when they get their search results. Hope that makes okay. sense, Adam. Yeah, awesome. Okay, well, perfect timing. We are exactly at our 45 minutes, so you did great. So Ellie, uh, thank you so much for sharing your, your thoughts, your wisdom here um, on all of this related to testing. And thanks everyone else for joining. Uh, we'll have another session next week, but Ellie, thanks so much. Thanks, see you guys online. Okay, have a good week, everyone. Bye-bye.